Let me say what a great pleasure it is to be here this morning and uh, uh, with such a distinguished audience indeed. And um, without sounding like a mutual admiration society, I, <laughs> I'd like to thank Paul, thank Anne and their colleagues, not just for inviting me here, um, but for all the work that Lisbon Council has done over the past few years and is doing. I used it uh, quite extensively in this book and um, I'm really grateful um, to the Lisbon Council for all of this and very grateful to Joachim uh, for coming. It's very good of him to take time off. He just got back from India 10 minutes ago, so he's come straight in here. What a marvelous thing. I look forward to his uh, comments. I also understand this is the Jean-Jacques Rousseau Memorial Lecture, so it's a double honor uh, to be here to give it. Um, the Lisbon Council very generously kind of gave out all these copies of this book, which is a bit embarrassing because it seems to suggest that you couldn't sell them, you know. That <laughs> <laughs> and, um, there's quite a good story from Alan Bennett, you know, as a famous British satirist who, uh, who writes lots of books. He's going past this bookstore, right? And he saw these piles of books in the bookstore. And he went, so he thought, you know, they're not being sold. And so he went in and said, could I sign some of these books for you? And the salesperson looked horrified and said, oh, no, we have enough trouble selling them as it is. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the title of this uh, book um, comes from, everyone will know, I think, the celebrated speech that Winston Churchill gave in 1946 in Zurich. And uh, I know President Barroso has recently again alluded to this speech. Um, I'm sure you all know it, but I'd, I'd just like to read one or two bits from it because I'd like to ask, where has the rhetoric gone? Where has the emotion gone for pro-Europeans? That will be quite a theme of what I have to say today, really. I mean, I look back at this speech 70 years ago and it still, as it were, talks to me across the generations. And Churchill says, I wish to speak to you today about the tragedy of Europe. Over wide areas, a vast quivering mass of tormented, hungry, careworn and bewildered human beings gape at the ruins of their cities and their homes and scan the dark horizons for the approach of some new peril, tyranny or terror. Sounds vaguely familiar from the moment, right? Among the victors, there is a babble of voices. Among the vanquished, the sudden, sullen silence of despair. Yet all the while, there is a remedy which, if it were generously generally and spontaneously adopted by the great majority of people in many lands, would as if by a miracle transform the whole scene. And actually I was thinking of calling this book as if by a miracle transform, but somehow it wasn't very grammatical. What is this sovereign remedy? It is to recreate the European family, or as much of it as we can, and to provide it with a structure under which we can dwell in peace, in safety and in freedom. We must build a kind of United States of Europe. Why should not there be a European group which could give a sense of enlarged patriotism and common citizenship to the distracted peoples of this turbulent and mighty continent? Well, you know, I think this speech with its eloquence and, and with its passion is still worth pondering today. And you know, Churchill made it clear, and this is sort of resonant today, that the UK is not going to be part of this great endeavour. The UK had its empire, and Churchill saw its future there. Churchill said in another context, if Britons are asked to choose between the continent and the open sea, they will always choose the open sea. Again, something resonant really with the current position of the UK today, I think. 
Well, I, you know, when I look back at this speech, it's a very familiar speech, but you look at it again with new eyes, and I drew inspiration from it, and in a way, would draw it through the whole of what I want to say in this talk. I mean, I'm British, and I'm a pro-European, which makes me a bit unusual these days, but I'm a lot more than that. It, it, you know, I'd ask you to think about it, but you know, I'm a passionate pro-European. And I like to ask, where has the passion gone among pro-Europeans? Why do we live in this Europe uh, separated between the technocrats, who seem to be the defenders of the European project, and the populists, who seem to have all the emotion and all the passion? That situation is surely not right. I mean, this is a pro-European group, here, but I still think it's worth saying, you know, why I feel uh, myself a passionate pro-European. And I would describe it as, you know, four reasons. One are what I would call the three P's, and the other is an N. <laughs> the first is still peace, because, you know, Churchill's words resonate. We had a war in Europe only 20 years ago. There is unfinished business in the Balkans. It's crucial to incorporate Serbia, Kosovo, Albania, and uh, the other Balkan states into the European Union. Second, prosperity. It sounds weird to say that, but European prosperity is enhanced by especially the single market, which adds on about well over 2% to European GDP. Uh, third, um, well, I'll, I'll skip one of them, I think. Third, the main thing for me is, is now like a, the, what the new narrative should be, and that new narrative for me has to be about power. I think that the, 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 the international system now is essentially a system of power. It's not dominated by the transnational associations such as the UN. It's primarily a system of power. The choice for Europe is a G2 world or a world in which Europe is somewhere close to being a comparable actor. The, to me, this is crucial for Europe's future. Uh, my fourth point, the uh, S point, is what I call sovereignty plus. I think we, as, as a pro-European, I think we should reverse the normal idea that you lose sovereignty or even that you pool sovereignty when you join the European Union. I think every country which is part of the EU, gains a net um, amount of sovereignty by doing so. And they do so even when acting alone. I think this is crucial. It's actually one of the problems in the EU in a way, because the nations feel themselves to be more important than they really are, even acting separately. But if you're the UK acting in the wider international world, you get back up because other states know you are part of the European Union and bound into a, a powerful association. I call that sovereignty plus, sovereignty with a plus sign, and I feel that it reverses the traditional wisdom. Well, what I have to say in the main bulk of my talk, it, it divides into two sections, um, which correspond, I suppose, in a way, different parts of this uh, book. Um, first, I don't think, I think it's a big mistake just to concentrate a discussion of the EU on the EU. And it's an even bigger mistake to concentrate it solely on the problems of the euro. So I, I wrote this book in some part as a work of social and political theory. And I'd like to make two or three points about what to me is the backdrop to any discussion of the future of the European Union today, discussing issues which actually stress well beyond, stretch well beyond the European Union uh, itself. So I got these three basic points. One is methodological. I mean, I've been a practicing social scientist for some, some decades, let's say, producing all these daft books that Paul alluded to. And I've always found the most useful principle as a social scientist is whenever you uh, see a, a trend, social economic trend, think about the possibility that it will go into reverse. In other words, think dialectically about the current world situation and the position of the European Union. Um, in other words, it, it actually seems to me highly unlikely the next 20 or 30 years 
will be like the last 20 or 30 years. It's possible that the next era might be, as it were, the Asian century, but I think we have to have severe reservations about that. Um, if you look at the category of bricks already mentioned, I won't spell them out, but you can see that it is no longer a category, really. It's no longer a category of straightforwardly, successfully emerging economies. Uh, most of the um, numbers among the BRICS, take Russia or South Africa or Brazil, are suffering severe problems. And I think the, the issue of China, you know, we all have to address, as we know, very carefully, but China has huge problems too. I think they're not just the conventional ones that people talk about. There are environmental ones, but other basic structural ones. For example, we want, we're fond of saying that in the West, we've got big problems with an aging population, um, but China has a problem with an aging population which is far greater than our difficulties, largely as a result of the one-child policy. China has no welfare system. It, has to, it must build a welfare system, I think. Um, in China, the way in which you care for older people is you save, but if you save, you don't spend. If you don't spend, you don't have domestic demand. See, the Chinese leadership very aware of these things and is certainly re reorienting the Chinese economy, quite rightly, I think, from the way in which it, uh, the trajectory it had before. And we all know, I think, that the grand bargain between China and the US can no longer hold. In other words, China manufactured goods for the US, and to some extent, us. Uh, we paid for those goods with money we didn't have funded by the Chinese, that system plainly can't um, persist. So I think we have to uh, look at a, a disjunctive or, if you like, dialectical um, view of history in looking at the position of Europe in the wider world economy. And to me, the most significant thing, and maybe Joachim will talk about this, is the real possibility which we know exists of a free trade area between the US and the EU. That seems to me a partial reconstitution of the West, if you put it that way. I'm very strongly in favor of it. It would add an enormous amount to GDP. And it would be the most significant intervention, I think, in world history of the past 10 to 20 years. So this is big business, really, for Europe and the US. And if it is successful, I would like to see it lead to a wider partnership, not just be a, a free trade area. As we all know, there are many, many problems standing in the way of that. So that's my first point, which is methodological. And, you know, affects Europe because sometimes those areas that seem in the most trouble rebound the most strongly. I wouldn't say that necessarily happen, but there's at least some indication it could happen with Europe when we feel it to be in the very worst position could be on the point of a transformation, especially where the right policies. Uh, my second point is substantive point of social theory, which I think you know, is absolutely fundamental to thinking about the EU because it's so fundamental to our world, and that is that we live in this world of just unbelievable social, economic, and technological transformation such that no one has ever experienced before. I mean, you know, you have your mobile phones that people are looking at surreptitiously, you know, under the desk and that kind of thing, or not so surreptitiously. But that is not what's happening. I mean, what's happening is just amazing transformation of global society over a period of no more than at most 20 years, which is so transformative that all of us are struggling to come to terms with it. Uh, to me, it's not an exaggeration to say that the advent of the internet and what is associated with it is simply the greatest transformative force in the whole of human history. We've never seen a revolution like that in such a short period of time ever in human history. And we're at the beginning of it. I think it's pretty plain that we're at the beginning of it. It's merging with production. I mean, I've taken a strong interest and have a quite a lot in the book 
not just about 3D printing, but about uh, digital production more generally. Lisbon Council also discussed it extensively. It's absolutely transformative, I think. The advent of digital production could completely transform not just manufacture, but the service industries. And it relocalizes those industries. So it's very much against the offshoring model. And a debate about offshoring is crucial to the domestic issues. I'll say uh, later, which we have to wrestle with in the European Union and which to some extent we have to wrestle with in all the industrial countries. Uh, to me, th this means that we're living in a, in a way an historically unique world which we don't have any precedent for. I call this in the book the high opportunity, high risk society. High opportunity, high risk society. On the one hand, we're intruding so deeply into nature that geologists have invented a new word for our epoch. They call it the Anthropocene. We've entered the age of the Anthropocene. In other words, the C-E-N-E, -E, um, in which nature is no longer nature, but human. For geologists to say this, this is something. We've invaded nature so fundamentally that nature is now our project and creates just extraordinary diversity of system risks and also opportunities. But to me, we're also invading the human body and we're invading the human mind. And as we do so, we're transforming, transforming the very nature of the human being. So when you're using your phone and you can't bear to let go of your phone, you have to ask yourself, are you using the phone or is the phone using you? Because it's become in a way part of your body Google Glasses take this process further, but there is an awful lot more to come. So the, the, the consequence of this is that we live in a dramatically new world in which opportunity and risk, including system risk, entangle in a way where we can't predict in advance very easily how the, the balance will pan out. The opportunities are huge, huge, I think, for the economy too. It's very hard in advance because they're so new to disentangle them from the risks. So I try to thread this through the whole book, the idea of a high-risk, high-opportunity society, and to relate it on the ground to specific um, policy decisions. Um, third, under this kind of theoretical, methodological section, um, it, in my view, it's, this is the time to take a fresh look at the European project as a whole. It won't do, as I said before, just to concentrate on the Euro crisis. To me, it's sort of, I suppose, not surprising, but almost all books on the future of Europe now concentrate on the Euro crisis. But this is a transformative period in the history of the world, which is going to affect all European institutions. So in the book, I try to cover the whole gamut of European institutions, regardless of whether they are formally within the competence of the EU institutions or not. Um, you know, you can, you can take many examples of this. If you take the experience of immigration, for example, now such a big issue across Europe, the nature of immigration is changed fundamentally by the fact you can now talk to your family back home from where you came every day, see them, talk to them in a face-to-face -face context on your mobile phone or your tablet, and you can do so in real time and for nothing, virtually for nothing. It completely transforms the meaning of what it is to be a migrant. And it's just one example of the tremendous changes going on produced by these things that affect our policy. Well, therefore, if you take you know, another example, we absolutely mustn't separate the future of the European social model from the debate about the future of the euro and uh, the wider issues of the economy. And it, the reason for this, I feel, is that we must break down the old division that existed between economic and social Europe. Social Europe is supposed to be the European welfare system. But it's a complete mistake to treat these two things in separation. That was the traditional idea of the welfare state. You generate revenue through the economy and then you redistribute it socially. That won't do anymore, we know that. We must have an investment-driven model of our welfare. And we know that what happens in education and so forth 
directly affects both the economy and welfare outcomes. So we must think radically again about what the European social model represents. And again, you could think very productively about it in relation to new technology. Um, uh, for instance, um, some people here will be social scientists, and the name Michel Foucault, oh God, he's back on his phone again. The, you know, the <laughs> <laughs> well, the phone is back on him, as one could say. Uh, you know, Michel Foucault had this um, very interesting account of uh, the emergence of modern society, that you get a concentration of discipline in the workplace, in schools, in universities, in hospitals, and so forth, in prisons. Now it's possible the next 20 years we'll see a radical reversal of that trend the decentralization of surveillance and power in each of these areas, driven in some part by technology, but also just by the sheer level of globalization. I mean, I work in the university sector. Some people here will have followed the advent of the World University and massive online courses. These are completely transformative, I think, for higher education. They are a direct threat, in a way, to the campus-based university or transformation of it. You can be in a seminar in the World University, for which you pay nothing, incidentally. You can be in a seminar with 10 people, all from different countries. You can interact with them in real time in a seminar. It's a pretty amazing transformation. The same in healthcare, the same in prisons, because we might deconstruct prisons. Um, because of the possibility of 24-hour surveillance, which is now more or less complete. And these things could, of course, be functional for some of the core problems we face with the European social model, since we know with an aging population, immense strains in the health system, but action at distance might have an important role in the future. I don't know if anyone here has been to India. I was in New York. Everybody's wearing these things around their wrists which monitor uh, how much energy you expended in the day, how well you slept last night and so on. Soon they'll monitor your blood pressure and your heartbeat. Well, uh, you know, you can feed that information back to a doctor and you can get treated at distance as well, in fact. So, you know, there are, there are a lot of things to think about. In the European social model, we should think well beyond the European social model in transforming the European social model. And that's what I want to say for Europe as a whole, I suppose. Well, when you come down to the core issues that preoccupy most people about the future of the EU today, um, there are three, three theses about the future of Europe that I want to propose to you and which you might easily, I suppose, object, object to. But three main theses about Europe's future which means not just the European Union, but I think uh, Europe as a whole. First, crucial one to me, the economic crisis, and again, Lisbon, Lisbon counts are very good on this, is not just cyclical, but structural. In other words, I don't think you'll be able to resolve the economic problems of the European Union simply by return to demand, which means we have to be much, much more imaginative in how we're going to address our core economic problems. I think, to me, we have to go well beyond the investment versus austerity debate. It, I mean, that debate, for sure, I think needs to be transformed. But even on the level of technology, so many things going on around work. Paul and Anne have a very good uh, study of small internet startups. Well, you can start a business now if you're two people and you can use technologies which only big corporations could have used even 10 years ago. Completely transformative, I think. Um, see, my feeling is we must broaden out the debate about Europe's economic future, and we should concentrate firmly, as in the other industrial countries, on this single issue. Where will net new jobs come from? Where will net new jobs come from? Because think of the number of jobs we need to create. We need to create jobs for younger people, or I think my view is that uh, statistics on youth unemployment are not all that reliable, and some of them are used rather wildly, really. 
sometimes you have to look at the unemployment ratio rather than the unemployment rate to get a real assessment of youth unemployment. So there is some exaggeration in some of the things you read in the press. Nevertheless, we've got to create a lot of jobs for young people, but we've also got to create a lot of jobs for older people because we know we can't support the existing pension system. Where will net jobs, new jobs come from? They have to be net new jobs because the level of job destruction is high. So my idea is, you know, I can't have time to sort of talk about in detail, is to pull out the stops, widen the debate much more widely, include things from the international arena as well when we think about job creation. We have to put all of our weight behind the efforts of the EU and the international community to re-socialize the anarchic world of the global economy. We must do this because about a half of all global capital at any one point is lying unused in tax havens and other tax devices across the world. In my view, a lot of that money is ours. It should be spent productively uh, on the citizenry. The inequalities that exist in the contemporary world are not like the old welfare state. They're extreme, so extreme we couldn't have envisaged them a few years ago. Well, we have to think imaginative about that. It goes back to the European social model. You can't just talk about the European social model in terms of the European social model. We must address these extreme inequalities or the social fabric is likely to collapse, but we have to do so preemptively in the international arena, and we've got to get used to thinking that this is part of our policy framework. Difficult that there is, but there is a consensus among G8 and G20 that we can and should do this, and this includes China and the United States, as well as the European Union. It's the first time there is a real possibility, and it's the first time we can see real change, I think. If you see what's happened in Switzerland, for example, it's a very good example of real changes that are produced and we need more of them. So all these things to me are relevant to the issue of net job creation because we're talking about investment here and we need the money to invest and we can't have masses of it locked up in uh, unproductive private capital. We must try and limit that anyway. Second, we live as we know in a German Europe in which we have, as it were, an informal president of the European Union, uh, which is Angela Merkel, or who is Angela Merkel? Angela Merkel, you must know, probably going, coming back from India, when I go around the world, she's the person that people identify with Europe. We have a German Europe, but a German Europe, to me, is inherently unstable because it has no legitimacy, apart from a functional legitimacy. Therefore, what happens over the next uh, six months or so in Europe seems to be going to be very decisively influenced by what happens in Germany. Um, we have this curious situation where you can't do anything in Europe at the moment much without the say-so of Germany, but Germany hasn't even got a government. So it's a very, you know, it's like a hiatus, really, because we know these fabulous changes coming down the line in the constituency of the officialdom and uh, European elections, and Europe is kind of paralyzed, waiting to see what's going to happen in Germany. Well, that, that can't be a situation which can endure indefinitely, surely. So to me, that means structural transformation. And I don't know what um, German colleagues sitting here will think, but I personally, having looked at it in a lot of detail, I just don't see any way in which the Eurozone can be stable without some level of mutualization of debt, however much it's hedged around with conditions. I just don't see how endless coordination can replace integration. At the moment, we've got endless coordination through the European semester and so forth and so forth, but that is so bulky, that is so slow moving. We're in this world of lightning pace. So to me, I think, you know, Germany, is vulnerable. The German economy is not as strong as it seems. It depends in some part on its membership of the Euro. I would like the German leadership to change its attitudes, whether it will, I have no idea, it doesn't look that way, uh, towards the rest of Europe. And I think if Germany can make a gesture over the next six months towards the rest of Europe, could have a tremendous impact on the European elections, actually, which all pro-Europeans, of course, are worried about. Thirdly and finally, 
this seems, I mean, this is quite controversial, I hope anyway, this uh, period seems to me a period of the end of the intergovernmental method. I mean, most people, I think, say that now we have to go back to the intergovernmental method because we haven't got the chance to really transform Europe uh, further. To me, that's a fundamental mistake. I just don't see how Europe can stumble on indefinitely in the current circumstances, especially if it's more of a reversion to the past than a transformation to the future. And therefore, the structural problems to me, which the EU has always had, that of democratic involvement of citizens and effective leadership, must at some point over the next 10 to 15 years be institutionally resolved. If they're not resolved, they don't really see a future for the European project. And you know, believe me, if the European project collapsed or the euro collapsed, it would be disastrous for not just for the European economies, but for the world economy. The main problem at the moment, everybody knows it, is that Europe doesn't seem to want what Europe needs. That is to say, the citizens are not interested in further integration just at a time when the very existence of the Eurozone presumes, presumes further integration. The Eurozone has integrated Europe. Make no, you know, make no bones about it, it has. The Eurozone is a set of interconnected economies, and the other countries around the Eurozone, like the UK, are deeply bound up with the fate of the Eurozone, so it's more or less a kind of integrated European economy. But as we know, it does not have the corresponding mechanisms, even with advance in banking union and so forth, to stabilise that. Well, how do you read the situation? Well, to me, that's a sort of like the crucial part of my talk, really, at least in terms of sort of immediate political um, um, innovations and political issues. The normal way to understand the situation, I think, is that <coughs> the, since Europeans don't want more integration, we have for the moment to stop here, and we have to recognise that the populists and the Eurosceptics are likely to make an enormous impact in the European elections in 2014, <coughs> and that could affect the transformation of the key institutional positions in the Council and the Commission and elsewhere. Well, I'd like to propose to you, and I don't know whether you would accept it, an opposite reading, I like a completely opposite reading of the situation, which is the following. Europe, for the first time, has a, a public space. For the first time, Europe has a public space because the, the European Union is discussed constantly within the politics of all constituent European nations. This has never, ever happened before. A good, a good example of this from the UK is that uh, when the German election began, there were pages in the British newspapers covering that election. That has never, ever happened before. Why? Well, it's recognition of interdependence, isn't it? It is a, a recognition of interdependence. The problem is that the public space in Europe, which is recognition in my terms that Europe has become a community of fate, driven largely by the, um, the, the Eurozone um, structure. Europe is a community of fate now, in a way it wasn't before, um, is that uh, th this public space is constructed negatively. It's constructed in terms of the critics of the European Union and the populist movements which we see around us. Well, why not turn it on its head? I mean, I repeat, I'm a pro-European and I'm a kind of passionate pro-European. Why should we leave all the passion to the populists? Why should we leave all the activism to the populists? Why should pro-Europeans be technocrats in the face of genuine popular and public feeling? Well, they shouldn't. So my idea is why don't we try and occupy that political space positively? And why shouldn't pro-Europeans be as activist as the um, populists and the Eurosceptics. For me, this can't be top-down activism, whatever the worthy interventions of the Commission, because top-down activism, that's part of the establishment. So I would like to call upon all other pro-Europeans here 
to combine on a grassroots level and to seek to contribute um, to the formation of the European public sphere, especially in the lead-up period to the European elections. What I have in mind is think tanks getting together, um, pro sympathetic pro-European media getting together, um, other pro-European groups getting together, and creating a proper public dialogue about Europe's future. We do not have such a dialogue at the moment. And why shouldn't we infuse it with a bit of passion of our own? Well, I've been trying to work on this myself. I call it Project Europe. And uh, I'm trying to sort of sketch out what it might look like. I don't want to be the kind of um, person who runs it, but I leave it with you as a proposal. And I think you know everyone should travel around Europe and should put the pro-European case. And there should be closer connections between think tanks and the media so that think tanks produce um, uh, popular versions of key arguments for the media. There is no more place that's more important than this than the UK. And if I could just close with a couple of comments on the UK. Um, the, in the situation in, in Britain is that the <laughs> Conservative government, if they get back in power, are 100% committed to an in-out referendum. They do stand a decent chance of getting back in power. Before that, there is a referendum on Scottish independence. It is a tremendously important time for the United Kingdom. What worries me is not so much that the UK might leave Europe, what worries me is the UK might leave Europe without the population having the least idea of what it implies. Because the level of popular debate about Europe is so low in the UK at the moment. So I think we've got an special obligation in the UK over the next six months, certainly, up to the European elections, but over the next three or four years to produce a, a proper popular debate about the UK's role in Europe. Make no doubt about it, you know, the UK could survive outside of the EU, but it, it would mean a wrenching change of identity. The public must not sleepwalk into such an outcome. So I envisage a sort of special version of Project Europe for the UK. But I would encourage everyone to <coughs> try and be active, try and uh, go around Europe um, stimulating pro-European debate, or at least putting the issues before the public, we should match the activities of the populace and the sceptics. <clears throat> I think there will be a battle for the future of Europe over the next six months and then in a more extended period. We have to try to do our best to fight an equal position within that battle. Well, Churchill, I started with, you know, was an inspiring person, a master of emotional rhetoric. He was also quite witty, so I leave you with a Churchill story which... I know one or two people from the LSE have heard before, but most people here probably won't know, don't know. Um, George Bernard Shaw was one of the founders of the LSE, of which I was the head. Um, he had this acerbic relationship with Winston Churchill, right? And uh, George Bernard Shaw, the story goes, true story, sent Winston Churchill um, uh, two tickets for the first night of his new play. And he said to Winston, dear Winston, here are two tickets the first night of my new play. Uh, please bring a friend, always assuming you have a friend. <laughs> and Winston wrote back saying, Dear Bernard, thank you for the tickets. I'm sorry, can't make it for the first night. Please send two tickets for the second night, always assuming there is a second night. 